I, I really want to get us started here quickly, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. He's a good friend. He's the creator of VRML. He's been working in virtual reality for longer than I've been alive. Tony Parisi, everybody. Tony? Thanks, Will. Uh, way to make me feel young there. Um, OK, great. Let's get me up on the screen. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what I'm thinking of as the coming distribution war for virtual reality. Uh, we're really excited about the potential of VR as a new medium, and many of us are feverishly working, building applications and creating new capabilities. But we're also starting to think about how we're going to feed ourselves out of this and, and turn it into a business. And so within all of this excitement, it's, it's probably you know, time, even though it's early, to start thinking about the ways in which we might uh, survive, make money, get our products out there, and, uh, you know, I'm going to try and keep this on a positive light, but there's a lot to think about, and there's a lot of, you know, challenging aspects to what's ahead of us here, uh, but probably the exciting part of this is, as an industry and as a collective, you know, community, we're going to get to make up some things as we go along, if we work together on this, so with that and without further ado. Um, so when we think about how we get our applications out there to the world, um, we might want to think about this in, in terms of, you know, who are going to be some big winners. I mean, you look at our industry now and there's some big winners and losers in, um, in uh, distribution, right? I mean, there's ways you get your application out there. If you're writing a PC app, you get it downloaded, you have to get it discovered. If you're writing an app for an app store, you have to figure out how to get above the noise and get discovered. And so, you know, we're already seeing people coming out. I'm sure there's boardrooms, you know, where business plans are being discussed about this kind of thing. Like, we're going to be the app store VR. Or we're going to be the Steam of VR. Now, Steam's probably going to be the Steam of VR, but just for at least a point of uh, discussion and, you know, thought exercise, you know, think about who would be the downloadable VR distribution point like a Steam. You know, some people are thinking we're going to be the YouTube of VR, right? Um, we're going to be the service where people find, discover, uh, free and easy to uh, get stuff, and anybody can publish. You know, YouTube's all about publishing yourself. Who's going to be the Netflix of VR? Some people are just going to want to be able to browse and get good VR content and know it's reliable and, you know, just pay for a service like that. And, you know, who are going to be the consoles of VR? And again, those are probably consoles, but maybe there's some areas where, you know, that whole world's going to get disrupted and things are going to change a little bit. And as developers, as people creating applications, you know, these, these things may be beyond most of us and maybe we really don't care who wins and loses, but it is going to affect our lives. And, and so these sort of tectonic movements are the things I want to talk about today and explore. Um, and we're going to talk about three major categories of this. We're not going to cover the whole landscape. We've got 20 minutes. Uh, I'd like to talk first about app stores, and we're going to talk about downloadable software, and then we're going to talk about browsers. So um, we're already seeing this movement, in, at least on the Gear VR, if everyone's familiar with that, and in the mobile, mobile world of cardboard, to put uh, VR applications into app stores and distribute them that way. So let's talk about what it means to be VR in an app store, the good and the bad, and we'll start with the good. Why do we like app stores on mobile? I mean, these came along, you know, largely there was, there was data plan restrictions, there were all these reasons for having apps you download versus just streaming content left and right, versus, you know, browsers doing all this, they weren't ready yet. So there's all these sort of accidental and, and sort of technical reasons why app stores um, evolved the way they did. But there's also the idea of an app store as being a better distribution platform and a better way for uh, uh, developers to monetize. I mean, we not only have search and discovery mechanisms in app store based on category, we have user ranking, so the you know, best ranked stuff gets to go to the top. That's wonderful, of course. As we know, you can game that system, right? And that's what a lot of mobile developers spend a lot of their time figuring out. How do I game the system and how do I get above the noise? Um, there's a theory, at least, and we're going to talk about this again in a moment, that this is a great way to monetize. At least there is a known monetization model for an app store, which is you can have your app be a paid app. And then beyond being a paid app, you can have an app that's free, but then has in-app purchasing. So these are clear and uh, well-known and consistent ways for the user to have an expectation about how they're going to pay for content and apps, and for developers to have an expectation about how they're going to actually make money on that. Um, the other good thing about an app store for VR is that you're curating the content. I mean, in the early stages of VR, I think everyone's a little worried it's going to be bad VR, whatever that means. I don't think bad, my, you know, my little hobby horse on this is, I don't think bad VR has killed any medium. If that was true, YouTube wouldn't be as big as it was, right? I mean, YouTube is full of junk, 
and look at how big it is, right? So I don't think the presence of bad content is going to actually hurt VR that much, but obviously you need a lot of good content, otherwise consumers won't continue to come to VR experiences. So it's good to have, in the early stages here, some sort of selection criteria on what is good content. Um, but again, you know, you need to be careful about that slippery slope of who defines what is good and bad. Um, in the case of VR, we've got a little bit more of a high bar here to worry about because uh, folks are actually worried VR can make you sick. That motion sickness is a real potential problem in VR applications. Now, having an app store, curated app store, decide that for me is a little interesting. If you think about that, like, you know, is that the job of Facebook to be telling me whether, you know, to be policing my, you know, nausea and my health? I don't know. I mean, someone should maybe. But that's an interesting concept, and the stakes are high in the beginning here. So I think it's important that we do have a filter on quality content to start. Um, but, you know, we've been told that porn's okay on VR, at least by uh, Palmer Lucky, but we're sure that's going to be true in a more curated app store. Who knows, right? And that's the bad thing about curated content, as they say in the last bullet here. Now, beyond that, what's not so good about app stores? Um, if, anybody building VR apps for Gear VR yet? Right? I mean, there's no way to actually build a Gear VR app without deploying it through the store. If you just had a simple enterprise VR app and you wanted to have it on the Gear VR, uh, you'd have to go through a lot of pain to actually get people uh, APKs, Android packages, for their devices so they could actually use them. It just doesn't work in practice. So essentially, even for an enterprise app, you somehow are going to have to get that onto the Oculus Store. That does not make a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, on cardboard, um, and the same is true on cardboard VR as well. I mean, it's an Android restriction. It will be an iOS restriction for cardboard VR. Is you've got to go through the store mechanisms just to de deploy. With Gear VR, more than that, you can't even get discovered. There's no way to put a link up where people are searching on the internet through a browser and then they get a link and it takes you to the Play Store, which you can then go and install the app. I mean, you're actually inside the Gear VR VR interface. And so maybe that's just a little temporary limitation, but uh, at the moment, there's no real search and discovery mechanism inside the Gear VR store. You're just swiping. So hopefully that gets figured out, but that is a real short-term limitation. Um, and then, you know, why are we always packaging everything as apps? Not everything needs to be an app. We're at an absurd point with VR right now where each video for some live act, let's say Paul McCartney versus Coldplay, you're making a new app and delivering that as an app. That's just bonkers. That's stupid. That's going to have to change. And you know, hopefully it will. Hopefully someone will come up with some standard formats for that. Um, but that's all well and good. But let's assume you actually want to go monetize and you say, that's fine. I'm going to live with that. I'm going to build something for the Gear VR because you know, app stores are the way to monetize. Well, here's a little fun fact. As I started thinking about this landscape and digging into it, I found an online report, Developer Economics uh, from uh, early 2014, the state of the nation. Um, they define this app poverty line for 2013 as an app learned less than $500 per app per month. And it turned out that across all mobile platforms, 60% of developers were below the app poverty line. So while it seems like making apps is the way to make money, that's true for the winners. It's not necessarily true for everybody else in the long tail. Now, th those numbers are a little bit better for actually for Apple's uh, iOS app store, and it's more like 50% below the poverty line. Still not great. But then look, you know, in the aggregate, somebody won here, right? Apple's 30% of the 10 billion that went through the App Store in 2013 netted them $3 billion, which was only 1.5% of their revenues that year. Didn't, didn't really move the needle for them too much, except it probably helped sell some phones and iPads too. So very interesting if you're thinking about app development. And really, I mean, it's not quite a zero-sum game, but there are definitely some big winners and losers. And just for me, there's just something that doesn't fit my gut check, right? It, we're, if we're thinking about the metaverse, a, a connected universe of VR applications, do we really think that's going to be going through an app store? I mean, we're modeling things on uh, success behavior that's worked recently with mobile. But that may not be the way this turns out for VR. So as we're moving forward, thinking about how things are going to get distributed, people are trying the stuff that they know recently worked. That doesn't mean that's going to work for VR. And that's going to be a recurring theme of what we're going to talk about today. Now let's talk about downloaded apps. What's good about downloads? By downloads, I'm talking about you go to a place like Steam, you download and install an application on your desktop. Right? This is the way that a lot of PC games get delivered, right? and Macintosh as well, desktop games. How's that going to work in VR? Well, here's what's good about it. You've got mechanisms for discovery. The Steam store is really awesome. right? It's got a great interface, a lot of search capabilities, a lot of user rankings, a lot of write-ups. 
That's actually all on the web. That's super cool. Um, and they got a great monetization going here. Now, Steam takes 30% just like an app store does. Um, and the developers, I mean, I was reading stories. I don't have hard numbers here, but developers are making some pretty darn good money on this, at least the ones who have successful games. Now, of course, for downloads, I don't know what kind of VR application you're thinking about building, but if you're not building a game, the download model might, might not work for you so well. Downloads in VR can be these really big, sort of game-sized things built in Unity, approaching a gigabyte for a download. If you're trying to build and distribute something that's going to get to a lot of users, and it's maybe for more casual use, it's not going to work. I mean, this is a core committed experience. I'm doing a download. I'm doing a desktop-based install. I've got to futz. I've got to think that it's going to be worth it. And in the large part, most of the applications people do that for these days are for games. Most people aren't downloading tons of software onto their desktop machines anymore. They take what's there, they browse the internet to do most of their other stuff, and then when it's time to download, they'll do that for a game, not much else. Uh, I'd like to give you some numbers on Steam, but they're a private company. They don't actually publish them. But they seem to be, uh, Valve seems to be doing pretty well, and developers in the large don't seem to be complaining too much. So if you are building a VR game, and you are going for desktop, this seems like a super great option, especially with Valve partnering with HTC on the Vive. I'm uh, really excited for that to come online as a consumer release. This could be a great venue for delivering uh, your applications if they're games or they're other high-end applications where the commitment level isn't that big of a problem. But again, you know, let's say I just want to do a VR history lesson. I mean, some of us love VR because it can do all this other stuff that's not gaming. History, archaeology, architecture, and the idea that I'm going to go get the latest history lesson by downloading another gigabyte of stuff the next day off of some place like Steam, it's just absurd. That's just not going to work. So yeah, downloads are cool for games. I don't know what else. So then let's talk about this thing called browsers. How many folks have heard of web VR? One, two, not, eh, a few of you actually, about 25%, that's cool. So web browsers actually support virtual reality, at least in uh, developer nightly builds. So in Firefox and Chrome, you can go get the download of these uh, latest browsers in the dev channel and they will talk to an Oculus Rift. Now, that, that doesn't work on a Mac or Linux anymore for a while because Oculus just mothballed their support for those platforms, but hopefully that's just a temporary setback. But the point is you can actually then do a browser-based application that does VR, talks to your Rift, tracks the positions of the uh, position and uh, rotation of the head mount, and lets you build your rendering in WebGL, and boom, you've got something that basically, after the initial upgrade of your browser, doesn't require a download for each VR application. And you can move from one to the next, you can hyperlink, you can build your app in HTML, which lowers the barrier to development for a lot of people. Not everyone's a Unity jock. I mean, that is really where it's at right now, is you need to master the Unity or Unreal engines or learn Android native and OpenGL development. And those are pretty tough for a lot of people. So the idea that, hey, I want to make my VR history lesson and I can use HTML tools and open source software to do that, that's really exciting. And I publish it instantly and someone can refresh at the touch of a button. And, and then I can send you an email, you guy in your blue t-shirt, sweatshirt there, and you're going to go like, yeah, I hit that email link and boom, I've got my VR application, no install required. That's awesome. The not so good news is that it's not so obvious how to monetize on the web, right? I mean. It's an absurd statement when you consider giants like Amazon and lots of other companies out there that have Facebook that have built huge businesses on the web. But it's not as clear and obvious for us low, lowly you know, app developers how are we going to make money building a web application. There's not one standardized way of doing that. So that creates a little confusion for all of us about how we'd make a clear path to you know, surviving, making money. Uh, so that's something you need to think about. Uh, web VR is not quite there yet. Uh, definitely not there on mobile yet, though there's been uh, some experimentation now with mobile Chrome, and it should be coming out soon for Android at least, uh, and for use with not just card, you know, it's cardboard style, but you can basically do it all in a browser using the Web VR APIs. Um, but in general, it's not quite up to snuff with the desktop implementations yet. It's getting there. Um, you got a bit of a performance gap. That's it's small, but you're you know basically building applications in JavaScript. And if you get some really brilliant engineers and/or a JavaScript-based game engine like Unity's JavaScript export, you can actually approach native speeds if you've done that well. Uh, but for some applications, if you're going super high performance on certain games, you just might not get what you need out of that. Um, browser UIs, they're trying to catch up now and figure out if there's a back button for VR. Uh, you know, there's sort of this whole browser legacy we've got of 15 plus years of browser technology that was designed for a flat screen that's currently only refreshing the screen at 60 FPS. They're going to fix that. But there's all these sort of things that are tied into a 2D desktop model that might not work for VR. So it's not clear that browsers are going to be the way you can actually deploy. 
uh, but we're certainly hopeful. Uh, and of course, oh, watch out. If anybody can build VR, then there's going to be some bad VR, and woe unto us if somebody makes some bad VR out there. Here's a fun fact about the business of doing YouTube. Uh, a couple of fun facts. So you'll make $1.50 for every 1,000 views you get of your YouTube video. So if you're Psy and you get a billion views, you make your $3 million or whatever it was on your video. But for most of us, if you spend $30,000 making some kind of video, uh, it's hard to make it back. YouTube is a great uh, platform for getting your brand out there and doing a lot of marketing. It's not a great platform for being a content creator, and YouTube still hasn't figured out to turn it into that. That's why they had $4 billion in revenues last year but still haven't made a profit. But I do have a dream out of all this that VR someday could be running in your browser and we'll figure all this out and then we don't need to do, go through all this app install and futzing. I mean, I think it's a great dream and maybe for some classes of VR applications it's really going to happen. So, we need to think about this. What are our survival strategies? I mean, we don't know anything yet. This world is very, very new. We all want to build great VR apps. We want to deploy them out to the biggest audiences we can. Um, we're going to look to leaders like Samsung and Google and you know, Oculus and HTC and Valve to lead the way into this wonderful uh, era for us, but we don't really know how we're gonna get our apps into people's hands or how we're even gonna make money yet. So you know, how do we survive that? Um, well, I can think of two strategies that are completely diametrically opposed to each other. The first would be, let's try and build something that's platform agnostic. I build something today, and I'm not sure which platform, which distribution vehicle it's going to go out on, and, and they're kind of tied together at this point. Unfortunately, you can't build one thing and, and not care where you distribute it. If it's desktop, it's going one way. If it's mobile, it's going another way. Um, so I'm going to try and build something that appeals to the most people. Uh, again, the cross-platform solutions we have out there, like WebVR is pretty immature. OSVR, which is open source VR, is a set of open source APIs primarily just for talking to devices. And they've uh, actually intentionally said, we don't care about rendering. So you still got to use an engine like Unity or something like that. You got to figure out that piece of the world. Uh, so it's really, really new. There's no guaranteed cross-platform thing. Unity is probably your best tool for going across the board right now. It even does have WebGL export, though it's a bit nascent and it's got some issues. Um, but you're still going to cook an app for each platform you know, that you're distributing to. It's not like you just build a piece of content and it just works everywhere, theoretically, like, mobile, uh, like, like web content does, though, of course, you're doing responsive design to make it work on different screens. Um, but here's the part, you know, they can put a man on the moon kind of part that just drives me nuts, is why haven't we at least figured out a 360 video format at this point, right? I mean... Top, top, bottom, MP4, are we going to do that? That mono, stereo, can we figure that out? And is that going to have some simple, limited amount of interaction in it? I mean, I don't think there's a way yet. I think it's coming from YouTube, at least, where you just feed it a top, bottom, 360 video, and the right thing will happen. Uh, you ought to be able to just hand those around, open them up, and they'll just play. But right now, you have to bake that into an app. So hopefully, that's a temporary, uh, temporary situation. Uh, so you know, one whole strategy is I'm going to build something now, and it's, I'm just going to make it work, you know, get it ready to make it work everywhere even though there's issues with that. The other strategy is, I'm just going to the metal for this one platform. I'm going to build something that's the best VR, uh, Gear VR app. I'm going to get in that Samsung store when they launch. I'm going to have a big hit. Uh, hey, you do well at that, that's probably a good survival strategy. You can worry about the other platforms later. And depending on the business and what you're trying to do, that may be enough. And again, maybe don't depend too much on big monetization yet, not be only because the market's small, but again, not all apps monetize that well. In fact, you may be better off doing a free-to-play figure out other ways to make money on it. Um, of course, if you don't pick that right, well, you may not live to fight another day. But at least that's one way to be rolling there. So um, that's all I got. I wanted to share some thoughts about that. And what, how much time we got here, actually? We got good. We got uh, five minutes or so for uh, Q&A before we need to get ready for the next talk, or you know, maybe even a little longer. So, Or just open discussion. It doesn't have to be Q&A. It can just be A or talk. Hey there. Go ahead. Uh, one thing that was missing in your first slide, uh, in my opinion, was the the Facebook of VR, the like the mega social hit, and uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. What are your thoughts on this? Let's start there. I think my company is going to be it. But uh, <laughs> can you tell us more, or are you in stealth? <laughs> Maybe later. Um, I don't know. There are a bunch of uh, interesting players. You have uh, the alt space. You have the high fidelity. You have uh, I don't know, converge. Uh, 
Um, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, do, do we believe that's the way the metaverse is going to look? Will there be you know, these large communities of multiplayer, you know, rich 3D worlds that are sort of more open-ended than games? Um, no, I think it's going to be more like small self-contained spaces that you can jump between. Um, yeah, High Fidelity's actually got a uh, disclosure. I'm an advisor to that company, so I have a business relationship there. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I like the way they're taking that approach because they're essentially creating an open platform. You know, it's the Second Life folks. It's the yeah. founding team from Second Life doing mm -hmm. this again. And one of the lessons they learned from the first time around was that it was a walled garden and that, that had a lot of limitations. So they've opened the entire stack. You can go on GitHub and get the whole stack. Now, you need to know what you're doing. It's not for the faint at heart, but if you can you know, deal with it and go do a build. You can build it and serve up your own stuff. You, in fact, can serve it up from your own machine. That's the way it works today. And you're just a node in this huge network. And so, A, that, and they figured out that, uh, uh, Philip and I have a big meeting of the minds on this, hyperlinks are what's gonna make the metaverse really happen. And so you can transit from one world in Hi-Fi to another easily with a hyperlink. And so they've done those parts really well and right this time around. So it's not necessarily one continuous world, which is a great insight. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't personally seen enough of where Altspace is going to know if they have, you know, also a viable, you know, strategy and a personal opinion about that at the moment. But um, yeah, I guess my big concern about all that is the usage patterns around synchronous multi-user are really tough. I mean, mm -hmm. to build those into a business where a lot of people are doing stuff synchronously and communicating in real time. Right. Um, right now they're hosting events like the Super Bowl and whatnot to get a bunch of people in. Right, and then yeah. when that's over, do they come back? I mean, this has always been an issue, been an issue with SL and, and these other worlds. And so unless you have some furious gameplay like you do in Warcraft where people are teaming up and clanning to go kill dragons and trolls or whatever, it is really tough to get that stickiness around that. I'm not saying impossible, but there's this huge activation energy around that. So it's one of the reasons I steered clear of it in the intro slides. But yeah, that could be a future you know, who will be the Facebook of, and it could end up being someone like those guys. Got time for a couple more? I saw another hand there. Hi, Tony. It's uh, Greg Panos here. Hey. Uh, uh, my concern is uh, how do you, <clears throat> what, what are your thoughts on breaking up apps into various types of data? Like you have asset packages, and then you have low latency uh, 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 state information, and then you have, you know, other kinds of hoops and, and uh, toll roads and toll things you have to jump through in order to uh, get it all gathered together for a mobile experience. And it's constrained right now by mobile carriers and data caps and throttling and stuff like that. Um, do you have any thoughts about what kind of extensible strategy might be really a, a good one to try to get everyone on board with in terms of all the players to make it so when you need to download an app, it, you get it quickly, you're satisfied, it runs well, the, the latency issues are solved, and the like. Um, I haven't heard much about that. So some of these packages are three, 400, 500 megabyte downloads on mobile that'll kill your plan, uh, certainly. I don't think mobile, mobile VR is going to play out that way anytime soon, right? I mean, in the existing mobile infrastructure we have, I, I believe, in this personal opinion only, the, the apps that are going to succeed in mobile are going to be somewhat short form. Maybe not as short form as a simple cardboard one minute and I can't take it anymore, but, you know, Gear VR short form maybe is an hour, um, and an hour session will be, you know, playing a few different games and using a few different apps. So each one is a short form, either cinematic experience, you know, like the stuff Interspace has done with their CG movies, or uh, the video content I was mentioning earlier, like, you know, rock concerts, that kind of stuff. I see those as being the best delivered nuggets of VR for mobile, you know, you know and gaming, of course, but uh, simple short form games like, um, I, I just love that one where you're, you know, shooting the pygmies with the spears on Gear VR, I can't remember what it's called now, it's simple Ford level demo version of that game, but I think those kind of simple, I mean, a pocket god style uh, mobile games for Gear VR are going to be real killer. And in terms of trying to do anything more complex and metaverse like that, I'm not sure a mobile VR headset as a, you know, running on the mobile phone client is going to be the architecture that makes that work. I mean, we may see future hardware and software systems that evolve out of this that are more, you know, an evolved version of, you know, desktop headsets, but somehow it's all sort of end-tier things running in the cloud, 
you know, delivered via Steam or a set-top even, and, you know, console. I just, I just think there's too many infrastructure issues doing it over mobile and uh, with mobile data. One more, and then we got to get rolling here. Front there. Him, right there. Sorry. Thanks. Guy Horowitz with uh, Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners. Um, you made a distinction, or you alluded to a distinction between uh, content and experiences or interactions. Um, and we talked about monetization. What's easier or what's harder to monetize? Is it the content that I consume alone myself or are those interactions that I pay to be part of? And do you see any like beginning of, of uh, successes as far as uh, monetization or uh, consistent consumption is concerned? I think, um, well, again, I mean, I just alluded to it with um, what works on mobile. I think this is going to be fairly true on mobile that short form games and video content will be the things people pay for. I mean, that just seems obvious, right? I mean, there's clearly going to be vertical applications that have a you know, great user base, whether it's in uh, you know, the stuff we're seeing in medical and architecture and all that already coming out of VR. Um, but content is more readily consumable because it's easier to produce if you're just doing straight video, if you're putting content in quotes, right? But it's, you know, the video game industry has also demonstrated that interactive content has a, is, is more compelling in many ways than just sitting back and watching a Hollywood movie, right? Uh, VR is going to change rules a little bit because you can move your head around. There's more interaction just by virtual looking around. So maybe it's even a hybrid. It's, again, nothing's going to fall into the models we think it is exactly, right? And the rules are all going to change. And, and we're just grasping for some kind of foothold because, you know, it's a whole new world and everything's shifting around us. On desktop platforms um, and the economics of uh, the Vive and the Rift, it seems like it's going to be gaming and steep verticals. I mean, you need new hardware to power it. Um, it's really optimized for PCs right now, at least on the Oculus side. We'll see how uh, you know Valve does with all the uh, toolkit stuff there. Um, so the you know PC orientation, the needing a, you know another fifteen hundred dollars total cost of ownership of of equipment probably means it's definitely going to gamers first. Um, cinematic stuff may have an interesting play there, though. I, I'm still grappling with. What does it mean to do positional tracking for cinematic video? That's, I mean, the, the positional tracking is wasted, right? The va half the value of a Vive or a you know, new Rift is positional tracking, right? Um, but again, those, I mean, they're, they're fairly obvious first ones. The, the real question is, is there something we haven't thought of yet that's a Yelp uh, or an Instagram or one of these other kind of apps that's going to consume 90% of our attention? I mean, the funny thing about the, the mobile apps thing, and I didn't even get into those, uh, you know, those uh, parts of the slides and the numbers, is if you look at the ones that, you know, get the most traction and downloads, it's actually Facebook and Twitter and all those free things that people are using every day that are monetized in a completely different way. They're indirectly monetized, right? Um, and those are fully interactive. Um, so those, th those are the X factors in this, but um, if I had to bet, I'd say that if you could make a piece of content, whether, you know, regardless how much interaction's in there, if you could make that and essentially build it once, and you might down res or up res it the way people do, you know, with video and bit rates. But if you could just do that and deploy, that would be the most readily consumable and the, you know, best content, you know, business model to have. Unfortunately, most interactive game-like content doesn't fit into that model. You're, you're coding it, right? That, is that helpful? A bit of a ramble. All right, just check time here. Will, how are we doing? Okay, we can chat a few more minutes here because we're still in uh, the wave of delay from the keynote, apparently. Dave. Thanks, Dave Aaron Dash from Closer VR Studios. I'd like to address what the previous guy was asking, and you were talking about bandwidth and so forth on mobile, um, is to point out that uh, most phones do have Wi-Fi capability. In fact, I just sacrificed my unlimited data plan <clears throat> to get the Note 4, so uh, the, um, the selling point was, but you can Wi-Fi, right? I'm like, good point. So uh, I'm not too worried about uh, big downloads as long as I've got uh, an open connection. And then, now you have this wonderful form factor of something like a Gear VR style phone that if you didn't need to worry about the 4G and it didn't need to be a phone, Jason and I were just talking about this yesterday, and thank you, Samsung HTC. I mean, you're welcome for the idea in advance. Why don't you just make the iPod touch of this stuff? Thank you. Why don't you just make a $200 thing that just does VR and stick it in a $200 headset, and now we've got VR at home with you know, massive bandwidth just using Wi-Fi. Precisely. Why don't we do that? 
Exactly. So you're on that program too, right? So we got to go tell Samsung. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah. You're welcome, Samsung. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. All right. Hi. Um, sorry, maybe I missed some of the first bits. So um, I'm obviously a big proponent proponent of the web delivery. Um, what do you think would make Samsung unlock that lock-in on the gear VR? You know, when you, you plug in the plug, it, it locks out the browser, basically. I, you know, I think a lot of what's going on with Samsung right now, we can all complain about the limitations of Gear VR. But I've got, I feel like I've got a pretty healthy appreciation for what's really good about it. I mean, I, I had an epiphany the first time I tried it on just from a point of view of human factors. It's like, wow, you know, easy touch, nice UI, you know, great step forward, though it's not perfect, right? And clearly the frustration with like, you know, especially if you're a developer, you just want to test the damn thing and you're jumping through hoops. There's not even a, anything like the alpha channel you have with, uh, you know, Google, Google Play, the Play Store, right, where you can actually do updates and, you know, push them out for testing. There's no test flight. There's no nothing. It's a pain in the ass, right? I think all of this is temporary, right? This is, this is just like the accidents of engineering and building the system right now to make it work and get the thing out there and see what happens. And so, you know, it's a bit of an agile play on Samsung's part, you know, and, and we're all helping them experiment a little bit, right? Um, right? I mean, so you think this is going to change at some point. By, you know, they're, they're trying to do that iOS lock-in thing, right. and, and it makes sense for them. I, I, I hate it, but I don't understand how I would convince them out of that because it makes business sense from their point of view. I don't know who actually makes money on that app store. I don't know how those contracts were signed. It may be Samsung, maybe Oculus. We, you know, I, I don't have insider information. That's why I, I can bravely say that up here and not get shot, because I actually don't know. But I mean, one question to think about is that. I mean, so does Samsung even benefit from that, or do they just benefit from selling more good phones and maybe other peripherals and, and you know, sticking to their hardware business and having this be a way to you know, boost those sales? Don't know. I mean, they're not Apple. They don't have everything fully integrated the way Apple's done an insanely good job of, right? Uh, but yeah, at least it seems like, theoretically, the motivation to do a lock-in like that is a good one. But, you know, if they don't get out and dominate and basically be the iPhone of this, then that developer loyalty that they're, gonna, they're seeing now, it won't be loyalty, right? I mean, everyone's jumping there now because that's the place to be. And what a great gravy train you can ride, right? But if someone like HTC or another phone maker comes along or, or you know, someone grows up cardboard to be less than, a, you know, better than a toy, then you're going to see developers flock in another direction because they're going to be like, you know, screw this. I don't want to be locked into this. There's a bigger opportunity over here. Um, but unfortunately, each one of those things on mobile will probably also be someone else's app store, right? Um, and then you're going to get it probably into the law of two, which is people can sort of deal with, you know, one or two of these. I mean, especially you've got to do a custom build and deploy, right? And so there's sort of like martinis, two's too few and three's too many. Um, so you can probably, you know, paraphrase WC Fields, look it up. Um, Anyway, you know, so you're going to see people, I think, you know, optimize for a couple and then maybe have a, uh, that same study that was talking about the app poverty line. There was like an average of two and a half platforms. It's like 2.5 kids per family. Average of two and a half platforms developers were working on. What they would do is they would optimize for two and then they would have some backup platform like for mobile HTML5 because it would get them to the point where they could do some web stuff plus potentially cross platform plus maybe hit Firefox and Tizen and some of these other environments. Um, so yeah, it's in an app store's interest to do it, but will they have the leverage and, and pull of, uh, you know, an Apple or a Google? Well, those things take time to build, and it's not clear who the, uh, you know, standing players are going to be uh, when that well, game of apps is over with. All right, really time for one more, because uh, we don't want to throw the agenda back too far. Got anybody else out there? Well, that's great. I th oh, we, we, do, we do, frantic hand back there. Last one. Yoni. It's Patrick from Dodo Case here. Hey, man. Um, How you been? I've been good. Um, so my question is about those indirect monetization strategies. Um, can you give us some more thoughts on that? I mean, mobile and web is largely monetized through advertising, right? So what does that look like? Well, it's monetized through advertising, but I mean, just think about, uh, you know, Kindle. I mean, at some point, Apple apparently had told Amazon you're not going to sell your Kindle books directly through your app anymore, right? But for a long time, they were able to do that until Apple clamped down on it. 
Um, but what you can do is you browse your mobile web and you go into your web browser and you go through the Amazon interface and you one click buy and then it shows up on your device, right? So Amazon, Amazon's monetizing that. Even though you had to jump out of the book experience now, you can't shop from within the Kindle. You have to go to a browser. Um, I'd say, you know, Netflix is another great example of this, right? I mean, you're just, you've got a free interface, it's a free app, but you've got a subscription-based content model. Now, in Netflix's case, you know, their deal is they've licensed tons of, you know, content that is known to be super popular, you know, namely movies, right, and TV shows. Um, so that's very unique to that particular media type, but again, Amazon with books and, and, and the like. And then, you know, you've got social networks and social applications like Twitter and Facebook who are generally monetizing through advertising, though um, they don't necessarily directly do it on those mobile platforms, right? I mean, it's, it just depends on it. If it's an app, you're not doing that so much. Mobile browser-based, you can get away with a lot more. Um, and then free-to-play games. Free-to-play games on mobile, uh, a lot of them are ad-driven. And uh, users, especially in the sort of casual to mid-core, are willing to put up with that little ad banner at the bottom or the top that annoyingly pops up during a game session just so they don't have to spend the 99 cents 20 times this month on different games. So I think those are all incredibly, you know, really viable. And, and they'll have some analog in VR, right? And unfortunately, it's probably going to be like, you know, something, some flying pig flying by you when you're right in the middle of some other application you want to be you know, paying attention to, but it was a free app. So you put up with the flying pig who's advertising you know, Wendy's new bacon burger. Um, anyway, I think that's all the time we have. That was a great question to, to end it up on, Patrick, because it gives us a lot to think about. You've been an awesome audience. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Looking forward to uh, the whole program today. Will, you want to take it back from here? Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you.